Good morning, students. Again, welcome to, I think, the fourth class of the Law of Thoughts. Uh, without wasting time, we'll directly go to the slides. I remember we stopped at egg shell skull rule, which is an important principle in the Law of Thoughts, egg shell skull rule. Try to imagine an empty egg shell or even an egg shell. What does it like remind you? It just reminds you of how vulnerable it is. If you think of an egg shell, a normal egg shell, if you just think of it, you know how vulnerable it is, how it's easily breakable, how if you just drop it, it crashes. So this principle is something related to the vulnerability of a human being and it protects people from, uh, you know, it protects the, the victim from you know not uh, you know from not being a victim of too much of defenses by the thought feeser eggshell a skull rule or it's also called as just thin skull rule or thin skin rule it basically uh, means that um, you know a person uh, just before i move further who is kasim i think you come for the first time in class yeah Kasim is a new student. Uh -uh, he's a new student. Yeah, he joined us now. Uh -huh, okay. So uh, Kasim, you'll have to go through the earlier recordings. You'll have to go through the Google Classroom. And of course, your class leader will be able to guide you further. If you need anything, you can always get in touch with me. Okay. Uh, well, let's continue with the uh, egg shell skull rule which is an important rule in the law of thoughts it is in the best interest of the victim to protect the victim it simply implies take the victim as the victim is next is that the defendant uh, you know is not uh, i mean the defenses made by the defendant uh, should not be taken just as it is but uh, you know uh, they must test the defense and they must also protect the victim because sometimes what happens the defendants come up with various defenses and they may say that of course we know that if the other party is responsible for uh, for the you know for the injury that is caused or where the plaintiff himself or herself is somewhere responsible for the injury caused especially in terms of pre-existing diseases are you understanding me let me give you an example. There, there, it, it is a true case, a reported case, uh, an English case. Uh, oh, there was this husband and wife. They, they were having an argument. So the husband was, you know, very um, uh, angry with the wife. And um, he just, you know, pursued her, just ran after her. So this lady, she was afraid and she just ran out of the house. And when she ran out of the house, uh, she just, you know, just while she was exiting the house, she just, just dropped. She just fell down. And as a result, she had multiple fractures and so on. Then this, um, uh, this man, uh, the husband, like, you know, then of course there was a case, the lady files case saying that it is because this man ran after me. So that is the reason, uh, you know, I'm just telling it to you like a story, okay, just for you to understand. This, just because this man, this guy, this person ran after me, that's the reason I got a shock and I just dropped. And as a result, I had I have sustained these injuries. So uh, long story short, the court held, uh, the, okay, the defense of the man is, well, not really. This woman has got multiple problems in her body. She, example, she's got high blood pressure. She's got all sort of problems. So because of this, the pre-existing condition, See the words that I'm using or the term that I'm using, pre-existing condition in her body. She's having pre-existing condition. So because of the pre-existing medical condition in her body, so that is the reason that, that that actually led to her fall. And as a result, she has sustained injuries. Now, what was the court's decision? The court said that you'll have to take the victim or the plaintiff just as the victim is. Sorry just as the victim or the plaintiff is. The defendant cannot really come up with excuses like pre-existing conditions, but the victim has sustained injuries, whatever may be the condition in her body, 
but it is because of the the act or the intimidation of or uh, you know of the uh, of the uh, defendant that led to her fall so the simply simple rule is that take the victim as the victim is actually it has come forth from a criminal case um, i'll go to the criminal case later just for your interest but let me complete this so therefore egg shell skull rule simply means that even if the plaintiff were sustained injuries even if the aggrieved party or the victim has suffered injuries and has because the person has also pre-existing conditions you cannot just say just because the victim is weak like a egg shell or like a thin skull who can easily be broken or can crumble you see just because the situation is like that the defendant cannot go scot free uh, you raised your hand yeah okay yeah yeah you raised your hand yeah yeah please ask me Uh, no question at all. So go ahead. Uh -uh. Okay. Someone. Okay. Okay. So I was talking about the egg shell skull rule. So this is this is just the uh, general idea. Of course, this is what it is. Egg egg shell skull rule or thin skull rule simply means that take the victim as it is, even if the person is having pre-existing conditions. And this was a real case that I explained to you. Now, there's a criminal case. Okay, so this principle is also used in uh, criminal law, and this came up in the case of R versus Blosh, B L A U C H E. Now, this is again just for your knowledge R versus B L A U C H E, Blosh. In this case, what happened was uh, the defendant uh, just goes to the house of uh, the plaintiff. And um, he's got some interest in her, but the girl is not interested. So she, he just tries to uh, get very personal with her. As a result, she uh, pushes him off and then he gets very annoyed and he stabs her with a knife. As a result, she lands finally, long story short, in the ICU. Now, in the ICU, she's, uh, you know, she's like battling her life and uh, now the lawyer of the 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 accused in criminal case you call the party as accused okay the one who commits the offense so the the boy that is the accused the lawyers the the, the lawyer of the accused came up with a defense saying that just to reduce his sentence of course the use of knife and uh, it is um, it would amount to an attempt of murder an attempt for manslaughter however uh, the def the defendant's lawyer, or sorry, the accused lawyer said that just to reduce the sentence, that uh, the girl actually now that she has sustained multiple injuries because of the multiple stabs and that she's battling a life in ICU, it is also because she comes from a so a kind of a, you know a kind of a, a different Christian background. I think they are Jehovah's Witness, something different, and. Uh, where they say that uh, they would not accept anything inside their body treatments are allowed but blood transfusion somebody else their, their concept is like this their religious concept that they will not allow blood transfusion into their system because it is it is not part of their body so she refused point blank blood transfusion so the lawyer says now finally she dies so the lawyer says to reduce his punishment when the girl has died, not because of the stab by the accused, the stabs by the accused, but it is because she has refused blood transfusion and no person of normal mind would refuse blood transfusion when you are on, a, on the deathbed. 
um, and even if she has given a religious reason of not accepting blood transfusion, that cannot be acceptable in the court of law under reasonable grounds. But the court held that the vulnerability of the victim, whether or not she, you know, refuses blood transfusion is not the question. The question is that the act of the accused was so grave to the extent that it could bring her to that condition, okay? And then that is the thing that has caused the death. Even if she has, you know, uh, refused blood transfusion, that cannot be considered. So let us not uh, consider the victim like an eggshell. The vulnerability of the victim cannot be taken into consideration. So therefore, the court sentenced him to the highest degree of punishment, or he was held guilty for manslaughter. So they apply this principle in R versus Blosh in a criminal case. This is a criminal case in 1975. And they use this, uh, this principle of egg shell skull rule. I'm repeating, it simply means that take the victim as the victim is. Pre-existing conditions in a defendant or the victim, uh, in the sorry, in the plaintiff or the victim or the aggrieved party need not play an important role while rendering justice and therefore the egg shell skull rule or the egg shell rule or the thin skull rule or even the thin skin rule can be applied. Let's go through our slides. Here. So the eggshell skull rule or the thin skull rule or the eggshell rule also called as in Latin uh, talent column rule. This doctrine is applied in all areas of torts, intentional torts, negligence and strict liability cases as well as in criminal law. In civil law, the rule emphasizes, that is it stresses, the need of compensating the victim for their losses even under circumstances where the victim was more susceptible to an injury due to a predisposing condition or pre-existing injury. So this is important. Even if the victim was more susceptible to injury due to predisposing condition or pre-existing injury, as is laid down in the case also of Smith versus Leash Bryan, that of tort visa must take his victim as he finds him. If you remember this case that we discussed during the last class, remember the, um, uh, the employer, the employee was performing his duties uh, during the course of employment. Uh, he sustained some injuries to his lip because of which it activated precancerous cells. Remember, we discussed this case. So it, in this case, it was held that a tort visa must take his victim as he finds him. Now, just because Carson has joined you, I'm repeating this. Whenever a case law is cited for the exam or for your assignment, it has to be written as a whole. Smith versus Leach Bryan and Company Limited, 1962, bracket closes, to Queen's Bench. You can just write QB, QB 405. QB means here, Queen's Bench. So you'll have to give me the entire citation. However, if it is a closed book exam and you really do not remember the entire citation, please don't give me wrong numbers because some, somehow whoever is correcting a paper will know the numbers, especially if it is landmark judgments or they are classic case laws. So we remember the numbers and even the citation. And also we have an answer key as well. So it's very easy for us to detect any wrong numbers. So if a wrong, citation is given, it would amount to negative marking because it would, it would imply that the student is just trying to, you know, just add some numbers there, you know, you understand. So therefore, don't give me any wrong numbers or wrong citation. If you don't remember, don't write it, but at least you will have to, you know, uh, name the case, especially landmark decisions and classic case laws. God forbid, if you even forget that, you can just say in one of 
the landmark judgments. At least you can write that. But to gain more marks, classic case laws, landmark cases have to be cited. So here, the principle is also used in tort. Which principle? The egg shell skull rule is used in tort as well as criminal law with the frailty or the vulnerability. What is frailty? The weakness. The frailty of the victim or the vulnerability of the victim cannot be used as a defense. Therefore, under this rule, a tort feaser. Who is a tort feaser? The one who commits the tort. What is a tort? Tort means a civil wrong. We are studying the law of tort. I'm just trying to devise for Kasim. We are studying the law of tort. Tort means a civil wrong. And tort feaser is a person who commits the wrong. So he is normally the defendant in the case that is against whom we file the case. So therefore, under this rule, a tort feaser is not exempted from liability if the claimant is susceptible to damage due to vulnerable factors or pre-existing medical conditions. So that's all for egg shell skull rule or thin skull rule. Now we will go to the next slide. The next slide is going to talk about medical negligence and breach of statutory duty, and that's also interesting. Now, what is breach of statutory duty? What is a statute? Statute means a law. Statute means a law that is promulgated or passed by the parliament. So as a law student, you, you have to use these terms. If you just want to say simply, what is a statute? Statute means a law made by the parliament. Are you understanding me? What is a statute? A statute is a law. What is statute? Statute means a law. So now if you want to go to the actual meaning of it, what is a statute? Statute means a law, okay, which is passed by an act of the parliament, or you can say it is enacted by the parliament, or you can also say which is promulgated by the parliament, or it is promulgated by the legislature. So we said, we learned earlier that when we studied about lawmaking, we said that legislature legislates. It is legislature that makes laws. So what is a statute? Statute means a law enacted by the parliament or passed by the parliament or promulgated by the parliament. Now, what is a statutory duty? A duty which comes under the law or a duty which is part of the law or a statutory duty is a duty that springs forth or emanates under a from a legislation. So let's see what statutory duty. A duty that springs from or emanates or springs from a statute or a legislation, legislation which is enforced within a territory is a statutory duty. That means a person has to abide by the law. So we can call it as a duty imposed by law. So law insider defines statutory duty as, statutory duty means any duty imposed by any act of the parliament. Breach of such duty, that is if you go against the duty or contravention of such duty, which springs, which duty springs from a legislation legislation, let us, sorry, I'm just, excuse me, from a legislation would be referred to breach of statutory duty. So I'm repeating breach of such a duty, which springs from a legislation would be referred to breach of statutory duty. That means if a statutory duty there is, is not complied with, or there is contravention of a statutory duty, or is simply not performed, which duty is mandatory under the law, that would amount to breach of statutory duty. What is mandatory? Which is compulsory under the law, under the particular statute or the act of the parliament is referred to as breach of statutory duty. That means simply when you don't do what you're required to do under the law, that is breach. Now, this can be better understood with a case law. In London Passenger Transport Board versus Upson 1949 AC 155, the court held that not all statutes Listen carefully, not all statutes or not all laws create a cause of action. <clears throat> Sorry. However, some do so expressly, that means some really stated expressly means it is worded there, others do not. 
So it can be expressed, it can be implied. Expressed where it is literally stated. Implied means it is understood as, or it can be interpreted as. So where the statute is silent on, where a breach gives rise to a damage claim, the courts must decide. So in London Passenger Transport Board versus Upson, the court said that it's not necessary that all statutes give rise, give rise to a cause of action. However, some expressly state a duty, some do not. Now, if a statute is silent on whether a breach gives rise to damage claim or not, it's for the courts to decide. So whether or not a claim arises depends upon the construction of the law, the act or the statute, and interpretation of the statute to be made liable for breach of provisions of a particular law or a statute. Now further, the court also observed in the case that a duty obliging motorists to approach pedestrian crossing slowly enough to stop if a pedestrian crossing was deemed to only apply to pedestrians rather than road users generally a private cause of action could therefore exist. So there, that means a person who is crossing, you see there's, you know, jaywalking is not permitted normally, first thing. Secondly is use the, you know, that the, the crossing which is there, you, you understand. Uh, so it says that when a pedestrian is crossing, okay, slowly enough, so the motorist actually has to stop for the pedestrian to cross. So a duty that obliges a motorist or a car driver or a vehicle driver on the road to approach the pedestrian crossing, that is a zebra crossing, slowly enough to stop if a pedestrian is really crossing is deemed to only apply to pedestrians rather than road users generally, a private cause of action would therefore exist. They said that in case you dash a pedestrian, that means the pedestrian has got the right to file a case against a person under the law of tort. Therefore, there may be a private cause of action or a public cause of action. Whether or not it is private cause of action or a public cause of action, again, could depend upon the edicts in the statute. That is what is laid down in the statute. And I would like to add on and say, it depends also what, uh, what is the situation, what is the circumstance. For example, rash and negligent driving, if an accident is caused, there are different things you know, law of thought, negligence, and again, there's criminal law. Under criminal law, of course, the driver will be held responsible for rash and negligent driving and so on. And whatever has to take place, like his license, whatever they do with the license, in case the person dies, then again, he has to, depending upon which country, what is the jurisdiction, like for example, in UAE, or, uh, you know, even in most of the Islamic nations, they talk about paying blood money in compliance with Islamic laws. So it's called as blood money. In some other countries, they, they would say, okay, we award compensation depending upon whatever, who, who is the cause and what has happened exactly depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case. So apart from that, law of thought comes here. Then negligence, apart from that, the driver's license may be canceled, vehicle may be confiscated, of course, if it's damaged, I mean, it depends upon the facts and circumstances of case. Several laws may spring up, depends whether it's a public cause of action. Public cause of action, example, criminal criminal laws, when it comes into the, into, uh, you know, it comes to the fore, that means it's a public cause of action. And again, private cause of action would be the law of torts. And it, it would depend upon edicts in a statute, even in a particular statute, or many other laws would come into before. So in yet another case, in Phillips versus Britannia Hygiene Laundry Company 1923, KB is King's Bench, 832. The court held that a duty requiring cars to be maintained in safe condition was deemed to, a duty, to be a duty which benefited any member of the public who used the highway. So this was deemed to be the public and so no private cause of action arose. This is just what the court decided in Phillips versus Britannia Hygiene Laundry Company in the facts and circumstances of that particular case. So what is necessary is just the principle. And then to succeed in a case alleging breach of statutory duty as a private cause of action, the following two factors must be proved. One, such an injury is suffered. That means there is an injury, there is a harm that is inflicted that the statute or the law prohibits. And two, the claimant is within the scope of the statute, that is the the party who is claiming it is, that means under the law of thoughts, it would be the plaintiff. 
the party that who is claiming it or the aggrieved party uh, just in case we disconnected please join we get disconnected please join back that the claimant is within the scope of the statute and or within the class of people that the statute was enacted to benefit. So therefore there are two conditions. One is there is an injury, which is actually prohibited by the law, which is prohibited by the statute. And second, this claimant, whoever is that the agreed party is within the scope of that particular statute to claim, the, to claim under that particular law. Next is medical negligence. So medical negligence is a most common form of negligence. We all know that there's several forms and there are N number of case laws. You will find it reported and unreported across the globe. And at some point of the other, I do not know every second person I feel on the earth might have gone through medical negligence because I believe, I mean, even I have been a victim of medical negligence, even Someone in my family has been a victim of medical negligence, which caused the death of the person. So, well, so medical neg negligence is, um, you know, the most common thought, okay? And it is a failure on the part of a medical practitioner to exercise reasonable degree of skill and care. That means, what is medical negligence? It is where a person, a medical practitioner or a doctor, any medical practitioner, doctor as you want to call them or even nurses they come under you know the medical um, you know under that particular uh, you know industry so medical practitioner to exercise a reasonable degree of care and skill in the treatment of a patient and that is, of course, a worse form of thought, which hits at the knuckles of the concept of duty of care. That means where the medical practitioner does not exercise his prudence, his skill, and his professional prudence, of course, it hits the knuckle. What is knuckles? This thing. It hits the knuckles of the concept of duty of care. The bones here is knuckles. So the patient relies on the skill. Of course, when you go to the doctor, you know that the person is professional in his field or her field. So we, you rely on the skill, the aptitude and the learning of the doctor and entrust himself or herself to professional care. So negating that duty, that means going against the duty of care and trespassing, that means contravening or crossing over the ken, that is the boundary of prudent, professional, actional, Uh, actions beyond all reasonable doubt would amount to negligence. Professional action, just I'll have to, you know, edit this. Negating that duty of care and trespassing the kin of, of prudent professional action beyond all reasonable doubt would amount to negligence. So in the earlier chapter, we learned about what is negligence and Black's Law Dictionary defines negligence as the omission as the omission to do something which a reasonable man guided by those consider, uh, considerations would ordinarily regulate the conduct of human behavior. It's not clear here, one minute. Okay, so in the earlier chapter, of course, we learned about negligence and under Black's Law Dictionary, it defines negligence as the omission to do something which a reasonable man guided by those considerations which ordinarily regulate the conduct of human affairs would do or doing something which a prudent and a reasonable man would not do. That means, as we discussed earlier, that, you know, displaying a careless attitude by a normal person, by a reasonable person, and where the action is I mean, it's expected to be reasonable act or omission, what he's expected to do or not to do. Now, free dictionary defines now medical negligence as the action or the error of commission or the lack of action, error of omission, commission, omission, doing something or not doing something during a medical procedure, which can lead to illness, disability or death. So that is medical negligence. The action, or you can just say, apart from this, you can just say commission or omission during a medical procedure, which may lead to illness, disability, or death is medical negligence. Further that, for establishing the tort of medical negligence, the doctor and the, or the health professional must, one, 
of course, the same principles of normal negligence. One, owe a duty of care. This is very important. Second, they have breached that particular duty. Three, this error of commission or omission for in medical negligence has resulted in a damage, a claimed damage or death or disability or some illness. Four, the errors were physically or temporarily very proximate or close to the damage or death. That means whatever error, whether it's commission or omission, it, it, it is the, you know, it's very close. It's, it's not remote, but it is very proximate to the damage or death. The cause is just because of the act or omission of the medical practitioner. And as a result, of course, there's harm and damages. Therefore, what is damages? I said compensation can be awarded. So there is difference between damage and damages. So you know what's the difference as we discussed in the earlier classes. Damage is just harm that is inflicted. Damages, it is normally compensation awarded by the court. So just you add an S there, the meaning changes. So damages can be awarded or damages can be claimed by the victim or damages can be awarded by the court. Now, simply speaking, a pragmatic approach needs to be applied while contesting as well as adjudicating a case of medical negligence. That means a practical approach needs to be applied. A reasonable practical approach needs to be applied when a person is contesting a case or even when the judge is adjudicating a case or deciding a case of medical negligence. Now to establish, a, because it's quite a sensitive issue, and there are a lot of factors involved. So now to establish a case, this is very important for ne medical negligence, apart from you proving the other factors that we discussed about, that is the, the general factors. Now, apart from that, in case of medical negligence, what needs to be proved? One is, of course, the person, the, the doctor or the medical practitioner, there was a duty of care, there is breach of that duty, harm has been caused, and you have to establish the nexus, that is the connection, the relationship between the cause of the injury and actual harm. Therefore, that means you establish causation. I remember I even explained the meaning of causation. Causation means the relationship between the cause and the injury, cause and effect. Cause and effect theory is causation. So you'll have to establish the relationship. What is the cause of the injury and what is the effect of it? Cause is, of course, negligence you have to prove and the effect of it is whatever harm is caused. So upon establishing the case, damages would be awarded by the court. Now, medical negligence may be a tort as well as crime. Now, again, depending upon the jurisdiction. For example, in Nigeria, Medical negligence is not directly seen as a crime since it is striped that criminal law in Nigeria does not always punish negligence. Under Section 24 of the Nigerian Criminal Code Act 1990, it states that no person can be criminally responsible for his unwilled acts. That means something which he did not desire to do or omission, or even the accidental consequence of his willed acts. So what they're trying to say is something that is accidental, you cannot call it negligence. So, I mean, they're trying to, um, I mean, the criminal laws, they say it cannot be covered under Criminal Code Act 1990. So which section now is subject to other provisions of the code relating to negligent act of commission and omission? So that this section has to be read with other sections to come to a conclusion, like what is the situation actually and whether a person should be held liable for negligence or not. Now, this case would make it clear. In R versus Akarele in 1941, there was this medical practitioner in, and he applied an overdose of a particular drug and the drug was called Sobita on several children, which led to their death. So the doctor was held to have been criminally negligent because he applied excess amount and he was convicted for manslaughter. For example, I'm sure you know that, I'm not talking about this case, but I'm sure you know that uh, extra amount of more than required dosage of administering, um, uh, you know, uh, anesthesia would amount to death of a person. So you, you you know, administer a drug which is more than required, it can cause, I mean, it can hamper the health of a person or 
cause a disability or even death. So in this case, 